first thing I want you to do is, is just to give us your first name, spell your last name, and uh, what branch of the service you were in, and if you have the division, just so we know who, or when we go back and look at the tapes, we know who's who. Edward Kurtz, K-U-R-T-Z, uh, United States Army. Okay. And, uh, okay, when, uh, one thing to try to remember oh, is, oh, oh, oh. Try, to, try to remember that, you know, people won't hear the question, and you kind of got to give them a little bit, uh, a little bit more information about what you're doing, but everybody's been doing fine with it, so I don't uh, think you'll have a problem either. So, if you if you can just give us a, um, a little rundown of your service, starting with that you graduated high school and. Oh no, sorry. Right. Whenever you're ready. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. Well, I graduated high school June tenth, forty three, and then. 28th of June, I was at Fort Custer in uh, Michigan. From there, we got our instructions, and I was shipped out to Camp Han, California. And I served my basic at Camp Han, California in an anti-aircraft artillery battalion. And then during that period of time, they needed more uh, I guess engineers, anyway, they divided our group up and we were sent to Camp Chaffee, Arkansas to be with the Combat Engineer Battalion. And I was there until such time as we were sent to Camp Kilmer, New Jersey to uh, go overseas. Uh, I don't know what else, it, I think I was... What, um... Where did you end up overseas? I think we shipped out for overseas the uh, first, first part of uh, 1944. And we were overseas until uh, January of 46 when we returned to the States. Where did you um, end up when you said you were going overseas, where, what, where did that, what does that mean, where did that include? Well, we were in the European theater and attached to the, to the Third Army. And during our time over there, we had to rebuild some bridges and, and uh, take out some landmines. After the, uh, we were actually in the uh, Rhine River campaign and the Central European campaign. And we were there until such time as the war ended in 45, I believe it was. And at that time, we were basically up near the Czechoslovakian border. And subsequent to the end of the war, they transferred our group back to uh, uh, Frankfurt on Main. And they put us to work, and we were working at the Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Forces, uh, which was the old IG Farben building in Germany. And that was taken over by the United States Army and, and the other services and became home for uh, General Dwight Eisenhower and his group. And uh, then about 46, uh, we were shipped back the United States. So you were in, you were in Germany after the war was ended and, and during the the, like the, occupation. the occupation. Yes. Um, well, we'll get we'll get back to that. But um, what what do you remember about boot camp? Was it tough? Was it? I <clears throat> I didn't believe it was that tough. They made you work. You had your hands full all the time. Up early in the morning, bed late at night exercises, drills, and uh, of course we had had to work and learn how to put up the bridges, take out mines, uh, but it didn't seem that hard to me. Of course, I was in the Michigan State Troops prior to going into service, so I did have some training before I went in. Um, I had a question. Um, what is 
Oh, wait, we'll move on. Um, we'll come back to it. Um, when you, you were learning to build bridges, were these like pontoon bridges and things like that? They were that? pontoon bridges, and they called them Bailey bridges. Uh, they were pushed out over the, the water. They were, it, it's hard to explain. And then, of course, we built decks on those uh, bridges, and that when the tanks went across. Were these type of bridges that they used when, when they the, the at the Rhine River when they were trying to cross the when they were trying to cross the. the... They they put up baileys on the Rhine River, yes, and uh, they also put up some uh, other bridges as you were talking about the. Uh, it's hard to explain, I guess. I don't know. Just... Were you in any sort of battle, or were you always after the troops went through, or before the troops went we, through? We were not really in any battle. At one time, we did get strafed while we were building a bridge, but that is about it. I was very fortunate. So, but are, does that mean you were you were putting up bridges after the troops went through? No, we put up some put, bridges for the trip, troops to go through. Oh, okay. We were never really uh, hit by the uh, enemy too hard. We were strafed at one time, that's about it. Okay. Um, what, what was it like to be in, in like a war zone? I'm trying, I'm trying to figure out what, it, what, was, what was it like for the, for the people who lived there. Did you come in contact with, with a lot of Certainly we did, and uh, they were afraid of us, and we didn't have too much contact with them. Uh, they basically stayed away. Of course, we took over some of their homes for our billets, took over some of their schools for our billets, and uh, but after, after the war was over, we seemed to get along pretty well with them. Um, you said after the war that you were in uh, you were in the occupied Germany. You actually were in the Supreme Headquarters. You worked out of that. We worked. We worked there. So did we, you? It was the IG Farben Building, which was a big sor company source in Germany at the time. And then uh, we took that over for our, the Supreme Headquarters, and we we worked there as occupational forces, doing. They had us building offices, they had us doing a lot of things there. Uh, just While you were there, did you ever come in contact with Eisenhower or anything like that, or see him around? I mean, no. I don't, I'm sure he's probably pretty well protected. No, I never did. Oh, I just, I just wondered, because I, I read, I was reading a book that talked about mm -hmm. after the war, what things were going on, yeah. and how he was kind of running things, and they mentioned the building you were talking about. Um, uh, let's see. Hard to remember a lot of these things. Yeah. Um, when you think back on your bridge building or, or any of the other things that you've done, is there any one event that, that you think back on and think, man, we really did a good job on that? Or... Well, not that I recall. We, we put a bridge across the Mains River there, which uh, uh, we worked hard at, and which was we got ready for some of the troops to go forward, and uh, we were we were protected at that time quite well by the infantry. Uh, the thing I I most recall, I guess, is pretty much towards the end of the war when we went into Buchenwald, one of the concentration camps there, and it was indescribable. And you went, uh, change your shot a little bit. And we went, and when you went in, you, that was while it was still, I mean, it, there were still had, prisoners there? It had just been there? taken over by the infantry. And there were still? Yes. Wow, that's, that, you're the first one that we've come in contact with that yes, actually. You know, yes. Um, how much did you know about about what was going on in Germany with the Jews and with 
be prior yeah. to getting into this. We, we didn't know any more than what we had heard previous to going to Europe. And I think it was on the newsreels and the movie screens and stuff like that. And uh, I was very surprised when we were at a location where we were able to move into the camp after the infantry took over. And it, it was just nothing pleasant to see, that's all I can tell you. Well, I, you know, I, I know it's probably pretty hard to talk about, but as I said, you're the first one that, has, that we've interviewed that had, had been there firsthand. Um, and I know it might be a little bit difficult to talk about, but maybe, maybe you could talk a little bit about and, and try to, to try to tell people what, what it actually was. I mean, you saw it firsthand. I mean, we see photographs, but you can't tell. Photographs. It was a death camp, really, that brought all the, the Jews into these camps, and they put them to death, either by hanging, they put them into units and gassed them, they put them into incinerators, uh, there were bodies piled all over when we went in there. How does that affect you? How did, did that affect? I cried. I cried. I think most of our unit did, but we weren't there long, thank goodness. Uh, those that were still living were like skin and bones. And Tripled, happy to get relieved. When when you went in, what what did what were their reactions? I mean, did they know who you were as far as Americans versus Germans? Or? They, they they knew, they knew because of the uniforms, and they were happy. Those that were still living. Was was that hard to forget? I still haven't forgotten. And I think they have a museum up in the Detroit area that were the Jewish people have put up to show what transpired at that time. I have never been there, but there's a museum there. Yeah, there's one in Washington, D.C., too, that, that I've been to, and oh. it's pretty dramatic. I, it's the only museum that I've ever been into where, as you walk through it, nobody talks at all. Nobody says anything. You don't hear any voices. You don't hear anything. Mm -hmm. It's just silence. And that, I think that's what really makes it mm -hmm. striking and really a personal yeah. experience. And it's, <laughs> maybe you'll get a chance to go there. Or maybe you don't want to go there. I don't know. But uh, um, is it, when, what did, what did you know about the concentration camps before did you know that they were there? Did you know that we knew they were there? Yes. I never expected to be near one or enter one, but we knew they were there. And you knew what the purpose of them was? Yes. I, I guess I don't know why then. Maybe maybe it just wasn't possible. But why wasn't anything done? If we knew what was going on there, why wasn't? that a priority or? I imagine it was a priority, but you, you had to get there first. You're fighting. You're fighting your way into those territories, and uh, you, you, you got to get to them. There wasn't anything else you could do. You can't, can't bomb them or anything. Is there anything that, that uh, you want to talk about, about the engineering part of it, that, that people wouldn't know about, that you thought was, mm. was pretty important to the war effort or, or, or caused the war effort to speed up for it? Not really, that I can bring up. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the memorial. Uh, you're going on the trip. Um, what are you expecting? from the trip? Just to know that a memorial was constructed to the World War II veterans, it, it makes it very interesting. 
just about every other unit had had a memorial constructed some way or other, and uh, it took so long to do it. it I don't know what it looks like, uh, other than what I've heard, and it just uh, I'd be very curious to see. It is it is pretty impressive. We we've seen video and, and actually got some video actually from the organization mm. that runs it, and it is pretty. It's huge. It's a big, wide open space mm. with well, I hear it. You know, circles of states. Each state has their own something. And mm -hmm. We're looking forward to going. Um, do you think it's going to be an emotional thing? You know, I don't think it will be that emotional to me anymore. Too many years have gone by. Although the Lutheran Homes put on a program here in Monroe about a week ago for the World War II vets. And that was emotional for me because they flashed on the screen some 200 uh, veterans who had been killed in action from the Monroe County. And several of them were friends of mine or that I had graduated with. That was emotional. But the big mall, I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to like it. I want to see it. I, I don't know how the emotion will be. Yeah, I guess you won't know until you get there. No. I mean, a lot of the guys have said the same thing, but I have a feeling it's going to be pretty emotional when you get mm -hmm. as many people, not just from your group, but, I mean, being there on the 60th anniversary of D-Day, which mm -hmm. is the day you're going to be there, there's going to be a lot of people there. Yeah. And uh, I have a feeling that once all you guys get together, there's going, to be, there's going to be some sort of bond or something that when you see that guy over there, you might not know who he is or you might mm -hmm. not know what he did, but you know that, you know, he's... One of the interesting things for me was when we shipped overseas, of course, we went to England first preparing to go to Europe. And uh, while I was in England, my brother came back from the European theater on rest and re-election leave, uh, leave, and we were able to be together for one night. Uh, he came in on one day, and we boarded the train to leave the next day. That was something to... Change your saddle a little bit. What did you, uh, what did you talk about? Home and our, our, uh, our folks at home and his service over there and basically what, uh, what we would be getting into too. Can I have you stop and say when, when my brother and I were able to spend time together for, what is it, four or five hours? Overnight. Oh, okay. Talk a little bit about what you talked about because you, so, so started out by saying when my brother and I were able to spend a little bit of time together. When my brother and I were able to spend a little bit of time together overnight, we just talked amongst us about the folks back home and what he had been going through over in Europe and what possibly I might be running to when I got into Europe. And... Uh, we had a nice conversation, but the time was very short. Did you ever see him again during Not the war? Not until I got home. No, we well, both we both were able to get home. Pretty fortunate. Um, that's that's a neat little story that you can say that you you ran up, and it was just by accident you ran into him. Well, yeah, when they, not by accident. He knew I was England. He he knew where I was at because uh, we'd been over there for about two months after being shipped out of the United States. So he knew where I was stationed there, and he was able to get there. And it just worked out that that was the day before we were packed up and left. Um, did you go over to, um, where did you go, France? Did that, you went, went into France, yes. And you went by what, troop, troop transport across uh, the channel? Is that how you? Yeah, by boat, Tra um, troop transport. So you must have been like replacements, or were you just... Well, you can refer to us, I suppose, as replacements, sure. We landed at Le Havre and then shipped right out of Le Havre and headed towards 
toward Germany. Uh, Did you have any idea what you were getting into? No. We were all scared. But it worked out pretty well for us. I was fortunate. Talk, about, talk a little bit about being scared. I mean, you, had, you had probably, I mean, you were a million miles from home. You really didn't know what was going on, but yet there must have been, a, there must have been something in you saying, like, this is a duty, this is what I have to do. I, there must have been some sort of patriotic thing going. But. I, like, I think that uh, patriotism was something else in those days more so than you, you find today all. I think we're all very patriotic. Uh, those of us, uh, well, we were 18 years old and we had no knowledge of, we had our training, we knew what our training uh, took us through, but we had no idea what combat conditions would realistically be. And as I say, fortunately, we never got into heavy combat, but you were still scared. You didn't know what you're getting into. You know, you, you say we were 18, and, and I, I think about 18-year-olds today. <laughs> yeah. And I don't think our 18-year-olds today are like your 18-year-olds were back then. There's just something, I don't know if it's what it is, but I don't know if our 18-year-olds today could do what you mm -hmm. guys did at 18. Well, of course, we had the incentive that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. That started things off right away. And then, of course, the European war was going on, and we got into that in a big way. So uh, you had all of us who were young that were entered into military service. Those that stayed home worked in the bomber plants and worked in other manufacturing plants to produce the equipment. Uh, the, the whole group in those days worked together. It was just a, a force that just meshed. Men, women, mothers, fathers, what have you. Um, I had another question. Um, come on, I must be getting late. Um, a lot of the guys that we, and we've talked to probably now, we've probably talked to 30 guys, and a couple women too. Um, none of them, almost to the number, think what they did as being heroic or being anything out of the ordinary. And these are guys who were at Normandy, and these were guys who jumped out of planes and things like that. Why, why is it, it seems that your generation don't think that you did anything out of the ordinary or heroic. I mean, all you guys to me are heroes, and, I, and yet you guys take it and, oh, yeah, I had to go do it. It's something I had to do. It was our duty. That's all I can tell you. And we looked at it as our duty and, and for our country. And whatever it took, it took. Why was why did Pearl Harbor make such a big deal? Why 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 did Pearl Harbor make such a difference in in the attitudes of Americans? Like you said, we really didn't want to really get into the war in Europe right away and, and that, but it seems that Pearl Harbor changed everything. Well, we were we were attacked without any knowledge that we were going to be attacked. All of a sudden, December seventh comes and they're being bombed over there and the ships are being sunk and. The, American Navy's gone to the bottom and people are being killed and taken to uh, war camps and everybody was just let go. They can't do this to us. That, that's all I can tell you. Um, do you guys have anything here? Any questions? Landmines. Oh, the landmines. Yeah, tell, talk a little bit about what what clearing a landmine? How do you do that, or what what happens? You were trained to do that. Then you did, you actually did that out in. We did it, yes, in, in one area. So it maybe if you started out by saying I was trained to, or or I was trained to, what, what is it? Remove landmines, or what's? The... We were trained to install them. We were trained to remove landmines, and. Uh, 
I can't say that we ever laid a landmine. We were trained to do it. But we did have occasion where we had to remove some landmines. And it, it's your training for the job. It, it's nothing that you like to do or enjoy doing because one mistake could be it. But it, it's a matter of taking your time, probing the ground, and when you find it, you take the steps to remove it, the safety steps that have to be taken. I, I can't go much further. Were there, were there times that any of them went off or anything like that? We were very fortunate, no. no. So I think the main, main ones that went off were during the course of the battle before they went through minefields. Can you kind of briefly describe exactly how you would, you, would you walk with a stick or with, how, do you, how do you actually find it? You're, you're on your knees, you're probing with your bayonet. And if you hit metal, then you just take your time and you start clearing away little by little because you don't know what type of thing you've got there. It might not even be a landmine, but in the other case it might. But the way you do it is on your knees and, and probe with your bayonet. So that was, I mean, you literally were going inch by inch through. Inch by inch through a certain area. And, and what did you have, like six guys or was all even with you or how did, how did, how were you, how did that work? You'd have, you'd have like a platoon lined up going across, yeah. You weren't out there by yourself. Slow. Slow. We were fortunate. We still have problems today if the landmines are all over. Kids are stepping on them, running on them. And you hope they never use them again, but they do. Um, who do you think the World War II Memorial is for? Is it for guys who served like you, or is it for guys like us who have never been in a war and, and need to be reminded? I think it initially put up for those of us who served during World War II as a memorial to us, but I believe it will have uh, a great influence on people your age and younger as to what they can expect or what what was what was done to keep our country free. You have grandchildren? Yeah, I've got quite a few. Did you ever talk to any of your kids or grandkids about what you did in the war? Or Not really. And, it's, and why is that? I don't know. We just don't discuss it. They never, your kids never oh, asked Oh, they've about asked for memorabilia to take to school or something like that. And I've given them things. I mean, a lot, a lot of the guys that we've talked to said the same thing. I mean, mm. I'd say 90% of them said we just didn't talk about it very much. Not, not too much, huh? Is it because you just you just wanted to get on with your life and move on, or you didn't think? See, that's another thing. Is you guys didn't think it was a big deal, and it, it's a huge deal. And uh, I was wondered. I just wondered if you had to tell somebody like your grandkids or a fifth grade class that you were say you were talking in front of a fifth grade class why you did what you did, or why the nation did what they did, or why patriot why is it important to to serve your country? Because I think that gets lost a lot today. Um, on why it's important to be patriotic and serve your country. What do you tell me? I can't answer that. I really can. I feel sorry for those who are fighting today. They don't know who they're fighting against. That, that, that's scary for those people. We, we saw uniforms. We know who the enemy was. Today those people don't. And I can't, can't imagine that what they must be going through. Although you said you're never really in a major battle, big battles, for somebody who's never been in a battle, what is, 
what what does a battle sound like or what i mean is it is it constantly loud is it is it screaming is it unless i don't know if you've ever been in a, in a real battle that i i always wondered how do you how do you tell somebody what a battle is like you'd have to ask someone that was in it oh okay okay um You guys got anything you want to know? Being strafed. Oh, okay. Talk, um, you said you were being strafed at a couple times by bullets. A guy we talked to who was on the Normandy invasion, I asked him if he remembers when the door was up and then when, he, when the door went down, if you remember what exactly he was thinking. He said, I know exactly what I was thinking and what I. He was a leader of it. He had to go up first. Mm -hmm. And he told me that he said, uh, the first thing he saw when the door went down were the bullets hitting the water, coming at him, and he knew that he had to go out there. Um, and I, I guess out of 46 guys, 17 made it to the beach from his, his group. And, I, and you know, I'm thinking to myself, how can you even think about going out there when you see those bullets coming at you? What's it like to no, be I, I wouldn't have, I, I wouldn't envy them. Uh, we just draped a couple of times. We were putting up the bridge. And uh, two German planes came over. It was strafing the the area. We all just took cover. You're you're prepared. You've got your foxhole dug wherever you're at if you're there. And uh, first thing that uh, we can think of, a bunch of them ran to the truck mounts and started firing back. And I, I was one of those people, but I never. And whether I hit anything or not. <laughs> yeah. um, is there anything that, that we haven't talked about that that you want to talk about, maybe that, that triggered something? Or now's your chance to, to say... No, there, there's nothing more that I can add to it. Okay. Um, if, unless these guys had anything else. Did you run into a lot of locals? Pardon? Did you run into a lot of local people? While I was in service? Natives of there, I mean? No. You didn't have too much contact with them? I just wonder how helpful they were to you, or were they just kind of neutral? Or You, you say local people. Like, are, like people oh, you're talking France about the German people? No, or no, the no. French? In, when or you were in France, France the people that lived in France. Were they, were, they, were they helpful to you, or were they just neutral? They just run? We, we never had that much contact oh, with them. Okay. Because you always hear about like the French underground and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm, that was going mm -hmm. on. And I just wondered if, if once you got into the area, then no, people we, would come we weren't involved them. that way. Oh, okay. Um, I guess the lead groups going in were, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, he was. Um, a, l a little bit about the reconstruction in Germany. Um, what what was Berlin like? Was it pretty much destroyed? I never got into Berlin. It, Berlin was pretty much destroyed. Frankfurt was destroyed. Uh, a lot of the villages. Some walls left standing, and uh, it's like going. All I can say is you're going through a war zone. The, the American pilots, the English pilots, had been bombing. You'd had your artillery uh, people firing weapons. There wasn't much left in a lot of places. So what their construction? I guess they practically rebuilt. You know, I guess. Uh, let's just change it up a little bit. I guess a little bit. I guess people, unless they actually see it firsthand, I don't think they actually no. can realize I don't think so. and fathom what it, what, it, what it means to walk down the street and have every building gone. gone. You know? I mean, that's got to be, for the people living there, that's got to be so stressful. Mm -hmm. and, you know, how do we rebuild the way we go? A lot of them are living underground in basements or wherever they can yeah. find a hole to crawl in. Well, I'm, I don't have anything else, so, uh, unless you no. do. Um, no. I appreciate no. you taking the time to come in, and I, I hope it wasn't I too don't. bad for you. And <laughs> you got me sweating like I was in combat, that's all I know. <laughs>